Cause it's a house of love A house of hope and dreams It's a house of God And you are welcome here And now in Spanish To quiero que vayas tú, to quiero que vengas hoy, bienvenido aquí, bienvenido aquí, to quiero que vayas tú, to quiero que vengas hoy, bienvenido aquí, a este lugar de amor, tus sueños e ilusión. Este lugar de amor, bienvenido aquí, si es este lugar de amor, tus sueños e ilusión, a este lugar. Welcome to Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation on this lovely autumn day. Chalice UU is a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, and we nurture the religious liberal spirit and are united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here whether you gather with us every Sunday once or twice a year or are with us this morning for the very first time, we are glad you are here. I'm Jessica Schultz, the worship associate today. David Peel is the worship assistant today, thank you. Pinch hitting. Our worship musician this morning is John Schultz. And I should also mention that our, our minister, you might notice, is not sitting right here, but she will be joining us soon. She has been exposed to an illness, but she's feeling well, and she will preach the sermon to us from her home today. And our song leader is Alice Dodd, our tech team, Dean Gadette, Hope Campbell, and Sarah Komnick. Our greeters today are the pinch hitting team of Sarah Susan Llewellyn and Paul Cartwright and Patty, Patty Carlisle and Susan Spoto, a whole, a whole team out there this morning. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of you who are here in the chapel and to those of you watching live using Zoom. For those of us here in the chapel, you'll notice that the windows are open. This is to ensure good air circulation in the room. We also have four air purifiers going. Please feel, if you feel uncomfortable for any reason, you can go out onto the patio here and you'll be able to hear everything that's going on from there. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us in worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in some of the many groups and activities we offer here at Chalice. And a good way to get this information is through our weekly email newsletter and calendar. Online news newcomers, you'll receive an email invitation to join our email list after the service. And in-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email address when you signed in today, please be sure to share it before you leave so that we can mail it out to you for the next so before the next service next week. And now, let's take a breath together. We acknowledge that our service is taking place on the stolen territory of the Kumeyaay, meaning humans or people, and the Payamkawisham, meaning Western people. A land acknowledgement works to undo the intentional erasure of indigenous people and to support the resilience and strength that all Indigenous people have shown. We acknowledge 
the original inhabitants as a first and critical step toward learning and working with indigenous communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and sacred homeland. And now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'd like to invite Linda Groling to come forward to light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words come from Reverend Sharon Wiley. The hours of day and night are in balance. In honor of Earth-centered traditions that we celebrate this time of the year, we observe that the flaming chalice hold the elements of the four directions, earth, fire, air, and water, the lamp oil for earth. Uh -oh. Well, I'm trying to light the chalice. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh. Can you help her with the match? It's oh. a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Earth, air, fire, water, the lamp oil for earth, the air that feeds the flame, the fire we light, and the chalice itself, the cup, the symbol of water. We light our chalice and reflect on the balance we seek in our lives, the balance we seek in our hearts, the balance we seek in our world.
The words of our call to worship today come from the Reverend Gretchen Haley. Because the tides are rising, so must we rise to this moment, rise to this day, rise to this life, this place in the web that is yours and ours. Rise, because the earth remains our only home and we fellow travelers, it's only hope for healing, wholeness, salvation. Rise before the mystery, before the big bang that started it all, that this infinite universe still takes notice of us, still feels the in and out of our breath, still holds us, connects us. Rise or surrender with gratitude for beauty, for this beauty, this chance, to be a part of it all, to give back, to weave life, pre past, present, future, everywhere, always as one. Come, let us worship together. And now you are invited to rise and join in singing. Good morning. Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, if you, you are welcome to write your joy or sorrow onto a blue candle card which David will collect from you. And online, please write your joy or sorrow including your name into the chat box. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud, and then we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes onto our YouTube channel, so this sharing won't be public online. We will have a few minutes of music so that you can write down what you would like to share. If you'd like to send Reverend Sharon a confidential note about your joy or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, 
please email her. Her email address will be on the screen in just a moment. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and for this we live. We light a final candle.
for all of the joys and sorrows that go unshared and unspoken this morning. These two are held in the love and support of this community. <laughs> and now we invite the children and anyone else Our story is called, What Do You Do With a Problem? Written by Kobe Yamada and illustrated by Mae Bessem. I don't know how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. I really didn't like having a problem, but it was there. Why is it here? What does it want? What? Do you do with a problem, I thought. I wanted to make it go away. I shooed it. I scowled at it. I tried ignoring it, but nothing worked. I started to worry about my problem. What if it swallowed me up? What if my problem sneaks up and gets me? What if it takes away all my things? I worried a lot. I worried about what would happen. I worried about what could happen. I worried about this, and I worried about that. And the more I worried, the bigger my problem became. I wished it would just disappear. I tried everything I could to hide from it. I even found ways to disguise myself, but it still found me. And the more I avoided my problem, the more I saw it everywhere. I thought about it all the time. I didn't feel good at all. I couldn't take it anymore. This has to stop, I declared. Maybe I was making my problem bigger and scarier than it actually was. After all, my problem hadn't really swallowed me up or attacked me. I realized I had to face it. So even though I didn't want to, even though I was really afraid, I got ready and I tackled my problem. When I got face to face with it, I discovered something. My problem wasn't what I thought it was. I discovered it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn and to grow, to be brave, to do something. It showed me that it was so important to look closely because some opportunities only come once. So now I see problems differently. I'm not afraid of them anymore because I know their secret. Every problem has an opportunity for something good. You just have to look for it. Who would like to come? Walk, walk on your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go there is love all around. Walk on your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go there is love all around. So in a moment, uh, Reverend Wiley is going to come on the screen and deliver her sermon from home. But a few words first. The inspiration for today's service came from Patty Carlisle, who was the winning bidder of this item in our church auction this past March. We have a reading today. It's from tripsavvy.com, written by Catherine Gallagher and fact-checked by 
Jillian Dara, and it was published in March of 2001. In 2016, a study published in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism revealed that the decline in Australia's Great Barrier Reef's health had been motivating more and more travelers to visit. Concerns that coral bleaching and ocean warming would limit future chances to experience the reef motivated tourists to travel there before it was too late. The research found that just under 70% of tourists visiting the Great Barrier Reef were most motivated by their fact to see the reef before it was gone. According to Australia's Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, marine tourism at the reef supports 64,000 full-time jobs and contributes over $64 billion each year to the local economy. Still, the ecosystem is experiencing widespread coral bleaching and continues to be threatened by coastal development. By 2018, Forbes had named the last, had named last chance tourism as one of the year's top travel trends, citing an increase in traveler desire <clears throat> to experience unique, vulnerable destinations and greater accessibility to travel by a growing middle class. For just about as long as there has been written language, there have been narratives describing the joys of travel. Travel literature includes guidebooks and memoirs ranging in tone from documentary to personal and reflective, from serious to hilarious. If you have never read Bill Bryson's book, A Walk in the Woods, Rediscovering America on the Appalachian Trail, you have missed out on some wonderful belly laughs. Poetry captures some of the exhilaration and let's be honest, some of the self-congratulatory feelings of travel. In his poem, Song of the Open Road, Walt Whitman proclaims, a foot and lighthearted I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. And this from Edna St. Vincent Millay. My heart is warm with the friends I make, and better friends I'll not be knowing. Yet there isn't a train I wouldn't take, no matter where it's going. From Francis Quarles, the world is an inn, and I her guest. I eat I drink, I take my rest. And John O'Donohue, when you travel, a new silence goes with you. And if you listen, you will hear what your heart would love to say. These proclamations and others like them celebrate freedom, choice, possibilities, adventure, and the thrill of leaving behind for a time what is known and familiar. And we are a congregation of travelers with multiple congregants out of the country right now, and many of us with stories from the trip we just took and plans for the next trip we'll be taking. My husband and I are looking forward to a trip to the Galapagos Islands next August, our first trip out of the country in over six years. And so, all of this pleasure and wonder and excitement and experience takes place now hand in hand with our knowledge that the greenhouse gases generated from traveling by airplane contribute significantly to global warming and the climate crisis. Not to mention the moral conundrum of knowing that tourism doesn't always have a beneficial impact on the places being visited. A 2019 New York Times article asked the question, when is it unethical to visit a country? 
A 2013 National Geographic article asks, is tourism destroying the world? The article notes, tourism is among the biggest global industries and as such has tremendous impacts, environmental, cultural, economic, that have to be acknowledged and addressed. And you heard in our reading a few minutes ago about the increase of visitors to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia because the reef is experiencing coral bleaching, a result of the rise in ocean temperatures. This is called the tourism paradox when increased tourism pressures places that are already in danger. As the destination or a species becomes endangered, demand to see it increases and attracts more visitors. This type of travel is being called last chance travel, also called doom tour tourism. So when I dig into a topic like this, the moral and ethical challenge of trying to figure out what to do, what's the right thing to do, it can feel overwhelming. Because if every member of this congregation committed to never flying on an airplane again, and we honored that commitment, I don't know that it would make any significant difference in slowing, stopping, or reversing the impacts of greenhouse gases. We could have a similar discussion about the ethics of buying groceries, of buying clothing, the ethics of how much meat we do or don't eat, animal byproducts. The problems of the world are overwhelming and trying to make individual choices that align with our vision and hopes for how the world should be can feel not just overwhelming, but impossible. There was a TV show that came out in 2016 called The Good Place. Did you see it? It was on for four seasons, and it started with the premise that someone had accidentally gotten into heaven, the good place. They weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> Over those four seasons, the show explored the great questions of moral philosophy. As is summarized on Wikipedia, within the show, there is reference to John Locke, Tim Scanlon, Peter Singer, and Derek Parfit. And the show has covered everything from Jonathan Dancy's theory of moral particularism to Aristotelian virtue ethics, to Kantian deontology, to moral nihilism. I don't know all those people or understand what all those words mean, but you get what I'm telling you about the show going deep with ethics and philosophy. Now, over time, the show had different timelines and lots of different things happening. So I don't think it's a spoiler to tell you that at one point, we explore the idea that it has become so difficult to live on this earth and not cause harm. Harm by buying products made through the exploitation of workers, harm by driving cars and flying in planes, harm by buying groceries brought in from other states and countries, that it has become so difficult to live on this earth and not cause harm, that no one gets into heaven anymore. It's impossible. No matter how nice you try to be, how off the grid you live, how diligently you try to live well, it's impossible. A quote from the show, these days, just buying a tomato at a grocery store means that you are unwittingly supporting toxic pesticides, exploiting labor, contributing to global warming. Humans think that they're making one choice, but they're actually making dozens of choices they don't even know they're making. More than any other aspect of the story told in this show, this part has stayed with me because I think it really lifted up what it feels like to be alive and trying to be a good person these days. A person who doesn't cause harm, who isn't making things worse, 
not to mention trying to live in a way that actually makes a positive impact. Back in 2017, I invited you to read with me a book called Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy by Chris Johnstone and Joanna Macy. In it, the authors talk about different ways of understanding the times we're in. And one of those ways is called the great unraveling. The great unraveling, they write, draws attention to the disasters that business as usual is taking us toward, as well as those it has already brought about. It is an account backed by evidence of the collapse of ecological and social systems, the disturbance of climate, the depletion of resources, and the mass extinction of the species. The great unraveling is the story that is overwhelming to contemplate. When we stay focused on all that is terrible and difficult and going wrong, we find ourselves overwhelmed and, un and unable to take action that feels meaningful. We can't let ourselves get stuck in the story of the great unraveling. Where we want to focus our energy is towards the great turning. The great turning is the transition from an industrial society committed to economic growth to a life-sustaining society committed to the healing and recovery of the world. What might travel look like in a life-sustaining society committed to the healing and recovery of the world? The answer to that question is not so much about the choices that individuals make, but more about the actions and commitments of countries and governments, as well as large corporations. In fact, the very idea that individual choices have a significant impact on our care for the environment is one that originates with and has been promoted by large corporations. The term carbon footprint was first coined in a 2005 television ad from British Petroleum, BP. The ad appears to show members of the public being stopped in the street and being asked, what is their carbon footprint? Most of them look confused by the question. They don't know how to answer it. BP explains that the carbon footprint is the amount of carbon dioxide emitted due to your daily activities from washing a load of laundry to driving a carload of kids to school. And do you remember that commercial from the 1970s? Meant a lot to a lot of people. Showing what we're supposed to think is a Native American man crying as he looks at the litter and pollution of the big city. The ad said, people start pollution and people can stop it. The ad was paid for by a group called Keep America Beautiful, a group established in the 1950s by leaders from packaging companies like the American Can Company and the Owens Illinois Glass Company and other public figures. The Keep, Keep America Beautiful campaigns against littering, but has also lobbied against bottle bills and legislation that would have required packaging to be returnable or recyclable rather than disposable. So back to that question, what might travel look like in a life-sustaining society committed to the healing and recovery of our world? What actions will countries and corporations take to reduce and hopefully reverse the impact of greenhouse gases? Well, here are some of the things happening during our great turning. Journalist Elizabeth Becker reports, countries are figuring out how to protect their destinations in quiet, non-offensive ways. Countries control the number of hotel beds, the number of flights to and from a country, the number of tour buses allowed. Some have sacrifice zones where tourists are allowed to flood one section of the beachfront, for example, while the rest is protected as a wildlife preserve or reserved for locals. 
Most countries are heavily promoting off-season travel as the most obvious way to control crowds. Last chance travel might be a thing, but so is sustainable travel, with goals to protect the environment, address climate change, minimize plastic consumption, and expand economic development in communities affected by tourism. It's trendy to want to conserve and protect the places you're visiting, and that's a good thing. <laughs> we want that to be trendy, and sustainable travel is especially um, important uh, to younger generation people, people in their 20s and 30s. The development of sustainable aviation fuels, such as biofuels, is already happening and will play an important role in reducing reliance on fossil fuels. And how is the climate crisis being addressed? The United Nations holds an annual climate change conference attended by world leaders to agree on policies to limit global temperature rises and adapt to impacts associated with climate change. The next conference begins November 30th, just a couple of months away, and will be held in Dubai. By the close of the conference, for the first time, the United Nations will have completed an assessment of global progress to slow down climate change. This assessment is called the Global Stock Tate. Stock Take. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot about it towards the end of the year. As the UN describes it, the global stock take is a process for countries and stakeholders to see where they're collectively making progress toward meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Change Agreement and where they're not making progress. Continuing to quote from the UN, it's like taking inventory. It means looking at everything related to where the world stands on climate action and support identifying the gaps and working together to chart a better course forward to accelerate climate action. So I have no doubt that this report is going to be mixed. <laughs> there's some good news, there's some bad news. And I have no doubt that this assessment and whatever comes after it will be imperfect and frustrating. And this is exactly where and how this work needs to happen at national and global levels. World leaders making commitments and hopefully following up on them. We as citizens need to do what we can to demonstrate our support for the United States to meet the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement. And we need to support politicians and elected leaders who are committed to eliminating the use of fossil fuels. And we need to do this visibly um, because our actions and, and beliefs influence those around us, our circle of friends and family. When they see that we're supporting, um, it helps elevate their awareness of what's happening. We can also look more locally here in San Diego County and in California, where important legislation is being implemented to address the climate crisis and reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So this morning, I have wanted to lift up that I think pressuring ourselves and each other to carry the burden of solving massive systemic problems through our individual choice, choices and actions is not the answer. But I also want to return to what I think is in our hearts when we ponder these big global problems. How do we live lives that reflect our values? How do we embody the changes we want to see in the world? And you already know the answer. We make changes in our lives that we feel called to make. Some of us drive electric or hybrid cars. Some of us recycle and compost. Some of us are vegetarian or vegan. Some of us don't travel by airplane unless it's an emergency. Some of us plan vacations that we can drive to. Some of us, we heard this morning, plan and take emissions-free vacations. Some of us shop at secondhand stores. Some of us have solar panels on our homes. Some of us invest money in sustainable energy development. Some of us are committed to not using single-use plastics. 
and I'm sure there's more. I hope during our social time today, you might talk with each other, we might talk with each other about the ways that you try to live your values and share those things. But let's hold each other gently. There's no one right way. There's no magical answer that will fix all the world's problems. Or maybe there's actually one magical answer. Vote. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Seated, standing, or online, you are invited to raise your voice in song. The Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Sharon Salzberg writes, generosity is characterized by the inner quality of letting go or replenishing being able to let go, to give up, to renounce, to give generously, these capacities spring from the same source within us. What we when we practice generosity, we open to all these liberating qualities simultaneously. Please text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the, the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to enter your credit card information. And if you've already entered this information previously when you donated, you don't need to enter it again. If your Sunday donation is meant to be a part of your pledge payment, please indicate pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on screen in a moment. If you prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box to the left of the chapel doors. You can leave those donations after the service, those doors over there. Please give generously. UU congregation, love is at the center of everything we do. Again, uh, Luca Bloom. Embers are falling in Eden. The great burning time is on. Who will hear the dreaming? 
All the wild birds are gone sky Strangers give water to strangers Who sit by the shoreline to cry Who will hear the dreaming Who will heal the land Who will hear the dreaming of children they cry out as never before they see the light and the pathway they see the dark and want more now I ring the bell for the stillness I sit by the river to learn Call on the wisdom of elders It's time a new spirit is born Who will hear the dreaming? Who will heal the land? Who will heal the dreaming? These are some words of reflection by the Reverend Ashley Horan. Another world is possible. We say it again and again. And even when proof lies somewhere beyond the horizon, beyond our reach, beyond our imagination, this is our faith. Another world is possible, not somewhere else, another world, another lifetime, but here and now for us and for all. Another world is possible. There's no single path toward that world. No one strategy or approach that will restore balance, heal brokenness, so wholeness, free creation. There are many routes towards liberation, towards freedom, but the abundance of options does not absolve us of the responsibility of acting. Another world is possible. The call, the duty of each moment in history is to discern who are we and what can we bring with humility, integrity, faith? What is the context and how can we address it with agility, resilience, and skill? What is the vision and how can we realize it with accountability, relationship, joy? Another world is possible. In this time of despair, of fear, of collapse, it, the time is both like every other era and like no other time in history. It's audacious to declare our faith and to commit our work to a world that is more free, more just, more whole. 
but we are an audacious people in good company with many kin, and we are ready to show up and work hard and stay humble and make friends and hold the vision starting here now today with us and persevering however long it takes until that other world is not only possible, but another world is here. And now please join in singing our next hymn. <laughs> from James Morrison, not Jim Morrison, James Morrison. <laughs> Within each of our hearts, there is a most glorious light. Go forth, let its spark help you understand what troubles both you and others. Go forth and let its light of reason be a guide in your decisions. Go forth and bring its ray of hope to those in need of help in both body and spirit that they may find healing. Go forth and fan the flames of passion to help heal our world. Go forth and spread the warm glow of love, pushing back the darkness of the world. Go forth and share your glorious light with the world. Love and blessings to each of you, blessed be. You are invited to close our time together by singing the well. And um, as you might imagine, since we're one week away from the auction, there might be an announcement after the service, so please return your seats. You think? <laughs>
Mamma Mia, here we go again. Thank you all for your auction donations. Now is our chance to support Chalice by bidding on those wonderful donations. Online bidding for the Chalice auction begins today at noon and runs through Sunday, October 8th at 5 p.m. It's fun and easy and helps Chalice, so bid early and bid often. You can find the link to the auction website, charityauction.bid slash chaliceuu in the e-news, the previews, the auction single subject email and on the slides after service today. <laughs> Though you have to wait for the live auction to bid on the dinners, you can purchase dinner for two opportunity drawing entries online today. Also, watch your inbox this week for all the details about the live auction on Saturday, October 7th. Thank you in advance for your generosity. And now, here is Dean to get us in the bidding mood. So annual spectacle of the auction. Today we're gonna to have a little practice for you. So we have here a very special item. It's the only one on campus today. It's the I'm only cinnamon roll. <laughs> <laughs> it's available for auction. But wait, that's not all. We'll get back to that. It's made of ingredients from around the world, Vietnamese cinnamon, brown sugar, but it also comes with a hot steaming cup of coffee. <laughs> That, you know, made here uh, with love at Chalice. So, if anybody, oh, 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 so the cinnamon roll. You can inspect the item, and we will take bids now. Two dollars, right here. Two dollars, right here. Starting with five dollars. Five dollars over here. Ooh, $10. Oh, the only cinnamon roll on tap. Oh, I can't help fake out. <laughs> you can test your donation to challenge. You <laughs> don't have to have cash. So, we have $12 in the back. $12 for what? 15 15 dollars What was that? 15 15 in the front. Anybody else? Wait once. Wait twice. Buy three times for fifteen dollars. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> Okay, go home. No, no. Um, <laughs> um, those of you who are in person, um, our social hour is going to begin in a few minutes online at the same Zoom link and Zoom channel. And in person, we will have uh, our social hour in the courtyard, of course. Those of you who are in person might want to bring your refreshments into the Blue Room and have a visit with our online congregants. And, um, I hear that Reverend Sharon might be on the, in that online group, so you might want to go and join her, join her there. So, um, and enjoy the day. You can get free.